If you want to transcend suffering, don't waste time away. Whenever we have five or ten minutes, practice mindfulness. Watch your breath and be mindful. If there's free time while waiting for me to preach and you just let your mind run around, you're just wasting your life away. We all have limited time, averaging around 75 years or 30,000 days and they pass quickly. Each day, if we practice for 5 to 10 minutes in an hour, In 12 hours, we get 60 minutes of practice already. Doing so, we will have enough time for practice. Otherwise, our practice is too weak. And we can't fight the defilements. So while waiting for me, you can be mindful with your breath. It's much better than letting your mind run around. When our mind runs away, it often collects defilement and suffering. So don't waste even a small amount of time. There's a pair of Dhamma we must learn. The mind and the objects known by the mind are Ramana. They always arise together. Be patient. We can't see the mind itself. And it's difficult to be mindful of the Aramana because mostly the mind will be taken over by them. The Aramana that can be used for our practice are Rupa and Nama, physicality and mentality. We assume our thoughts are reality. Don't believe them. Instead, be aware of the mind going out to think. The important point is to be aware of the rupa and nama with the mind as the knower. To see the rupa and nama clearly, we must practice seeing them. Right now, your body is sitting. Just sense that your body is sitting. Sense your body breathing. We can see that the body is something known with the mind as the knower. Can you sense your body sitting and breathing? Can you see the body is something being known by the mind and it's not an animal or a person? If sitting still is too stagnant, you can move deliberately. Move your hand like this and feel your hand moving. When I started practicing, I had a handheld fan. And whether it was cold or hot, I would be fanning myself. 
I had an electrical fan on my desk, but I still liked to fan myself. When I was not analyzing issues, I would move my hand and my mind would feel my body moving. The body is an aramana, the object being known, and the mind is the knower. There's always this pair of knower and the known object. With more practice, our mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom will improve. We have to see that the moving body is not us, not ours. The body is just a collection of rotating elements. Let's practice. Let's try moving our hand. Can you feel it moving? Or are you just thinking? If you're just thinking about your hand, that's not correct. Just feel your hand moving in a relaxed way. Don't be too stressful. Don't let your mind be heavy. I used to see that people at concerts would raise their hands and jump around. It's just a bit of difference between a realm with no mindfulness and a realm with mindfulness. While dancing, if we mindfully see our body moving, then we could reach nirvana. If you have a heart attack and can see the body that's falling down is not us, then the mind may let go. So it's just a bit of difference between the correct and incorrect practice. Just add correct mindfulness and concentration in your practice. When our hand or our body move, just have the mind as the knower and feel it. When our body is moving and we are aware of it, we have mindfulness of the body. But don't let the mind move into the hand. If so, it's not good concentration because our mind has moved. So just see the body moving with the mind as the upright knower. This is having mindfulness and concentration. Next, wisdom can arise. It will see that this moving body is just a group of elements. It's not a person, not an animal, not us. So if you go to concerts and see people dancing, then we can move with them but with mindfulness. If you see our body jumping and moving, this is Dhamma practice. Dhamma practice is not sitting or walking in meditative postures for a long time. Dhamma practice is mindfully knowing the present as it is. By knowing your moving body and mind. We must set aside a fixed time slot for sitting or walking meditation practice every day. Can you feel your body sitting and breathing? If not, you can move your hand and feel it. Your mindfulness and concentration will improve. Without mindfulness, the mind is unwholesome. And if it has mindfulness but not correct concentration, then it's a calming meditation. For example, if we were to focus into a crystal ball, the mind would not be immersed and mindfulness would be fixated on the ball. 
In this case, the mind is going out to the object, so it's only a peaceful meditation. Keep practicing. Sense the body whenever it moves. And our mindfulness and concentration will improve. Soon, wisdom will arise and we'll see the body is not human, not an animal, not us, not them. Practice using the body as an object to be known. And we'll gradually lose interest in this body. We'll be able to see the mind. Initially, we will be able to see the body is not us. Not them, not human, not animal. Then we will be able to see it has no substance. It's suffering, impermanent, and non-self. And finally, the mind will let go of the body. Once the mind lets go of the body, it reaches equanimity, being calm and peaceful. Now, let's see the known objects that are Nama, mental. What are Nama objects? The feeling of happiness, suffering is a Nama. Let's practice knowing the feelings. Try touching yourself. Not too soft, but enough to feel the sensation. Can you feel the feeling arising within your body? This sensation is called Vedana. If only touching is too soft for you, try pinching yourself. Can you feel the light, painful feeling that has arisen? This is the bodily Vedana. At first, we have to intentionally practice, but then we'll be able to sense the body Vedana quicker. Mindfulness arises from remembering the phenomena. When the mind is able to remember bodily Vedana, mindfulness will arise quickly. While you're sitting, can you feel the itchy sensation arising here and there? That is also a bodily Vedana. If you feel the itchiness and proceed to scratch immediately, we won't see Vedana. So next time, Feel the itchiness arising in your body so you can see the Vedana first. Then next to arise will be Sankara, mental fabrication. The desire for scratching will arise. When most people sense the itchiness, they scratch immediately. They don't see the Vedana, the disliking and the desire to get rid of this itchiness. So when itchiness arises, just be aware that Vedana has arisen. And then the desire to scratch. After you scratch, the itchy sensation disappears. And happiness and a sense of fulfillment arises instead. Starting with Vendana, we get to easily see mental fabrication. Keep practicing and we'll be able to see the Vedana and Sankara are suffering, impermanent and non-self. Is itchiness permanent? It is not. If you have a strong will, we can watch it without scratching. If you just watch it, 
We'll see the itchiness arises and fluctuates between stronger and weaker and finally disappears by itself. We'll also be able to see that itchiness arises by itself. You can't control it. Not being under control is the characteristic of non-self. This is how we watch the phenomenon. If you watch mental Vedana, just be aware whenever the mind has happiness, suffering, or neutral feeling. As we practice more and more, the mind will remember the happiness, suffering, and neutral feeling. Then, whenever happiness, suffering, neutral feeling arises in our mind, Mindfulness will arise automatically. Mental suffering is more crude and easier to be mindful of than happiness. Neutral feeling is the most difficult one. It's easy to be ignorant of it. In our mind, there's always one of the three feelings. Whether happiness, suffering or neutral. Always one of the three arising and circulating in our mind. So if you practice watching the mental Vedana, just be aware whenever our mind has happiness, suffering or neutral feeling. Then we will be able to see the mental Vedana are impermanent. When happy, the mind could think of something else and then suffering arises instead. Happiness, suffering, neutral feelings are all impermanent. Even if we train our mind to be empty, when the mind senses something new, it could quickly turn to happiness or suffering. Practice until our mind can automatically be mindful of the happy and suffering feeling that arises. However, it's easy to be ignorant of the neutral feeling. Ignorance can lead us to the animal realm. Although there are more than 7 billion people on the planet, there are a lot more land and aquatic animals. There's so many animals because most minds are filled with moha, ignorance. So we have to practice. Don't be lost in ignorance. Did you ever have a cat or a dog? Most of the day while there's no stimulus, they just sit idle, lost in ignorance all day. If you let our mind stay lost in ignorance all day, we're training ourselves to become an animal. So let's be mindful. Whether our mind is happy, suffering, or neutral, just be aware of it. With practice, we'll be able to see the three characteristics of Vedana. Bodily Vedana is more difficult to be aware of than mental Vedana unless it's some strong pain. For example, if you feel a small breeze, a comfortable feeling may arise in our body, but it's easy to just enjoy it and not be aware. Similarly, when we have happy feeling, mentally, it's easy to enjoy and be lost in happiness. This is called Nandi Raga, under the family of greed. When watching bodily Vedana, it's more difficult to sense the changing characteristics. For example, when we get a cut, it takes time for the pain to subside. 
but for mental Vedana, it changes quickly. We can easily see the three characteristics all the time. Of all the Nama or non-physical phenomena, the mental fabrication and Vedana are easiest to watch. Sana, memory, is more difficult to watch. I have seen some people mess around with it and almost go crazy. Vedana is simpler. Whenever happiness or suffering feelings arise in the body or in the mind, just be aware of them. Practice being mindful frequently and will develop automatic mindfulness. Having automatic mindfulness is important because at such point the mind has a strong wholesome quality. If you still need to intentionally create a wholesome quality, it's still a weak mind. Of all the non-physical phenomena, mental fabrication and Vedana are easiest to watch. Mental fabrication can be either unwholesome or wholesome, such as faith. Faith doesn't mean gullibility. It's not going to pray here and there and calling it faith. That's not faith in Buddhism. Faith in Buddhism is having faith in the three jewels. Having faith in the Buddha is having faith in the wisdom, mercy, and pureness of the Buddha. Having faith in Dhamma is believing that Dhamma can bring us out of suffering. Having faith in the Sangha is believing that people can get rid of defilement. All the noble people used to be just ordinary people. But after practicing the Buddha's Dhamma, they developed and cleansed their mind. The Sangha are those people that have cleansed their mind with the Buddha's Dhamma until they have reached true purity. With enough practice, we can prove for ourselves that the Sangha truly exists. The layperson's mind is still sloppy. Their belief is always wavering. Sometimes they believe in the Buddha, and sometimes they don't. Some people may think that monks are not trustworthy. Sometimes there's news that monks can still do something wrong. But those are assumed Sangha, not one of the three jewels. The Sangha in Buddhism means that the noble people from the stream enter upwards. Monks that you see wearing robes are assumed Sangha only. They pass through the ordination process. But are not yet noble people. The real Sangha may not be wearing yellow robes but their minds are firm in Dhamma. When faith arises in our mind, notice whether it's faith or gullibility. Blind faith is not faith. It's gullibility. But some people mistake it for faith. Whenever faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma, or the Sangha arises in the mind, be aware of it. With sufficient practice, we may even want to pay respect to ourselves once our mind is clean enough. But we won't feel this clean mind as a self. We'll feel as if it's part of the three jewels. Another example. Virya is a wholesome mental fabrication. But in Thai language, 
it often means general diligence. Viriya has its own meaning. Like how the word faith in Buddhism means faith in the three jewels, not faith in ghosts or in other unfounded beliefs. Viriya doesn't mean general diligence. A thief can't say he has viriya to rob other people. Viriya means diligent in reducing and eradicating current defilements and preventing new defilements. The way to do this is to be aware of your own mind. As soon as mindfulness arises, defilement is extinguished and a new wholesome and awakened mind arises instead. So having mindfulness is also having virya. We just need mindfulness and virya will arise automatically. Virya doesn't mean walking or sitting meditation for the whole night. Doing so is erring on the side of asceticism. Controlling one's body and mind too strictly. So Vriya doesn't mean having general diligence. The important point is having mindfulness. Vriya in Buddhism means reducing current defilements. Preventing new ones. Developing new wholesome mind states and growing existing wholesome mind states. These are the four markers of virya. To summarize, virya is eradicating and preventing unwholesome minds and developing and growing wholesome minds. It's not about praying all night hoping to win a lottery ticket. That is not virya, nor very smart. Winning a lottery ticket is not about praying all night. It's about probability. Faith, virya, mindfulness, and wisdom are wholesome fabrications. Once our mind has become the awakened knower, sometimes it's accompanied with wisdom. Sometimes it's awakened without wisdom, which is still good, but doesn't help develop it along the noble path. So if your mind is stuck in stillness, don't let it be stuck for long. Once it has enough rest, utilize it for wisdom development. Wisdom development is seeing that phenomena are suffering, impermanent, and non-self. Seeing the body, the vidana, the mental fabrication are suffering, impermanent, non-self. This is wisdom development. Wisdom development is vipassa in seeing the three characteristics of the phenomena. It's not just thinking. Some knower minds see the characteristics and some just awakened and right without wisdom development. These are still wholesome but without wisdom. Be aware whether your mind is doing or not doing wisdom development. This is a wholesome fabrication. Unwholesome fabrications are even easier to be aware of. 
Anger is usually the easiest one. Anger is the crudest fabrication. It is sharp and stinging and has a lot of consequences. Raga, lust or love, is more refined and has less consequences. And sometimes it can look like happiness. But whenever anger arises, the mind is struggling and has no happiness. So it's easy to notice when the mind is irritable or angry. Notice that whenever our eyes, ear, skin, nose, or tongue senses something unsatisfactory, anger arises. We can see that anger doesn't just arise, it arises with a cause and is not in our control. This is seeing characteristics of non-self. Sometimes we just neglect it and don't think about what is causing the anger. In this case, the anger will disappear because we're not feeling the anger's cause. Because anger arises, the mind has to think about something that causes the anger. When most people get angry, they just focus on the thing that's causing anger. For example, if a dog is barking too much, our mind will focus on the dog. Or when we see someone we don't like, our mind fixates on that person. Or we may not like a politician, but we keep following the news about what he does. In these cases, we are feeling anger in ourselves and the anger will grow. Keep practicing and we can see that anger needs a cause for it to arise. The mind has to send something unfavorable and think negatively towards it for anger to arise. So anger arises or extinguishes due to its cause. It's not something we can control. Anger is also impermanent. Sometimes it is strong and sometimes weak. For example, if we think that our spouse doesn't take enough care of us, we can feel hurt. We can see this feeling is impermanent. Sometimes arising strongly and sometimes weakly. We also can't control it. This is seeing the characteristic of non-self. Keep watching and we can see the level of anger fluctuates. Sometimes we think of other things and it disappears. So we'll be able to see that it is impermanent and non-self. Anger, hurt, sadness, hatred, These are all from the anger family. They are the easiest to be aware of. Raga, lust, love, is more intimate and refined. It is more difficult to watch. For example, we love ourselves, but it's often difficult to see that we love ourselves the most. We may think we love something else, but we really love ourselves the most. There's nothing else in the world that we love so much. However, with enough wisdom, we can see that we love ourselves so much. Keep watching and we'll see the raga is impermanent. It can't stay as it is forever. When we think of something else, raga disappears. So we can see Raga arises and disappears from its cause and is not under our control. Another family of defilement, Moha, ignorance, is the most difficult to watch. Anger is the easiest. Lust, craving is harder. And ignorance is the most difficult to see because ignorance is not knowing the phenomena. Moha arises together with all defilements. Anger and craving can only arise by having moha first. 
Moha can also arise and exist by itself. It's very clever and can be anywhere. So it's always difficult to be aware of Moha. The Buddha says anger has high consequences, but it's easy to relinquish because it's easy to see it as suffering. Hence, it's easy to let it go. On the other hand, Raga has less consequences. We feel attached to things we love, so it's difficult to see Raga as bad and to relinquish it. For example, we love our kids and it's difficult to see that such love has any consequence because it looks like it's not causing any harm. In the case of anger, we can see it's not good. But in the case of Raga, it's difficult to see, so it's difficult to let go. In the year BE 2525 or AD 1982, I went to see Long Pu Te. I went with a younger brother and he said to Long Pu, I want to relinquish Raga, but I see my mind still longs for it. Long Pu replied, if you still long for it, you can't relinquish it. Then he explained further, if you want to relinquish it, you need to see its consequence. Seeing its consequence is seeing suffering. When we feel love and attachment for something, take notice whether it causes happiness or suffering. Whenever we love something, whether it's our dog or our spouse, that love causes suffering. When we see that love brings suffering, our mind can slowly let go of it. So Long Pu taught that we have to see Raga's consequences. If you don't see suffering from Raga, we cannot let it go. Long Pu taught that we have to see our suffering. Take notice that whenever we love something, we feel attachment and suffering from it. It's difficult to see as it seems to be harmless, but keep noticing the truth and our mind will slowly let go. The Buddha says moha has high consequences and is difficult to let go of. Anger has high consequences, so it's easy to let go of. Raga has less consequences and is difficult to let go of. Moha has high consequences and is difficult to let go of. Moha is the one that created samsara, which keeps circulating because of moha. The head of moha is avicca. It's hidden right in our mind, even in meditator's mind. And because of it, the mind keeps struggling. And how to be released from its grip, even when we want to, that is still having tanha or of wanting something. We want to be liberated because we still love ourselves. So it's quite difficult. But do take notice of this too. Begin with the easier ones first. See the anger and cruder moha, such as seeing when the mind drifts away, thinking. When moha arises, we forget our body and mind. So we have to practice being mindful. Keep practicing. At first, we see crude phenomena such as anger and lust. Later, we can be aware of moha more quickly. I've been talking about watching phenomena today, watching the body, mental, physical, vedana, and the mental fabrication. Another key phenomenon is the mind that is the knower. There are two groups of phenomena. One is the mind, which is the knower. Another is the aramana, which is of being known.
I've already taught how to be aware of our mana, both physical and mental. The Vedana and the mental fabrication. The next one is the mind itself. How can we notice it? This one requires observation. Initially, we can't see the mind wandering through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mental channel. But with practice, we'll be able to. This is good for starting out, but still incorrect. What actually happens is the mind arises at the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, or the mental channel and is extinguished right there. There is not one permanent kind running around to the eyes, the ears, and running back. If you think there's only one mind, that's incorrect. We've been fooled by illusion. It's like seeing cartoon characters moving on the screen. They never really move because each frame is still. But all the frames being shown in quick succession creates the illusion that the character is moving. It's difficult to see movement of the mind as it moves quickly without leaving trails. So we need a lot of practice. How do we practice? At first, we relax our mind. Take a big exhale, and if sighing when people are stressed, they need to take a big exhale and feel more comfortable. Try exhaling and you'll feel more relaxed. If you inhale, you could feel stiff. Taking a big sigh like this, the mind is relaxed. Then try intentionally sending the mind somewhere. Normally, the mind runs around without us knowing. But now try sending it to the hair. You can touch it too. Let your mind focus there. Forget everything else in this world. Only concentrate on your hair and take notice that your consciousness is at your hair. The consciousness is the mind. It's the mind that has arisen at the body, at the hair. Once we can catch it, try moving your consciousness to your nose. You can try touching it too. Until your feeling concentrates at your nose. After catching your mind at the nose, then move it within your body. One part at a time. Practice moving your mind from head to toe. Whether your mind is at your thumb or your toe, be aware of it. Just practice within your body. Don't practice outside, otherwise your mind may run away. Practice within your body. Move from one body part to the next until you're proficient and you can see it automatically. Then, whenever the mind goes away thinking, seeing, or listening, you'll be aware. We can start by intentionally moving the mind within our body. Move it to the nose, to the ear, to the shoulder, etc. Keep practicing until we can notice the mind moving by itself. The mind moving to see, moving to hear, etc. At first, we'll see the mind moving here and there. But as our mindfulness and concentration get better, we'll realize that the mind doesn't move. The mind arises in order to sense through the eye, the ear, and it's extinguished wherever it arises.
there's not a single mind running around. This is a bit difficult to see, but just practice by sensing your mind moving. Keep practicing. Wherever your consciousness is, that's where your mind is. Then we'll be able to see that the mind is impermanent. It arises through the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind. The mind is non-self. It chooses to arise through any channel by itself. Sometimes when we're sitting, lost in thought, something can pass by us and we don't take notice. But if the mind is interested, the mind that is thinking will extinguish and arise at the eye to see instead. At first, we would see it as if the mind that was thinking moved to see instead. But if we can see in more details, we see that initially our eyes were open, but the mind was lost in thought. When the mind gets interested in an object, The thinking mind is extinguished and the mind that senses sight arises instead. With this, we can see the mind arising and ex extinguishing through all six senses the whole day. Keep practicing and we can see that all the aromana and the mind itself are impermanent, suffering and non-self. We'll see that there is no true self, that the five aggregates are not human, not animal, and at this point we can become the stream enterer. However, we need sufficient concentration. So every day we need to set some time for calmness practice. Practice staying with the single object and our mind. We'll have more power. Then we can see its movement and our mind will be upright. When the mind becomes the upright knower, we can see that all the aramana and the mind are impermanent, suffering and non-self. Wisdom can arise after the mind has become the upright knower. It has been 45 minutes already. That's all for today.